I hear people say this all the time, and, and I'm not against it, but it's, it's just not the way Jesus did it. Uh, I hear people say, you know, first you train people, then you equip them. And if you look at what Jesus did, Jesus equipped people, and then he trained them. He did it exactly backwards. He, what he did is he put tools or weapons in people's hands with zero instruction of how to use them. And then, as they made mistakes, he said, basically, well, you know, that's really not the way you do it. You do it like this. Or he just let them figure it out. And see, we think that's irresponsible. We believe in the Western world that if you give people enough information, that it will produce transformation. And it's not accurate. That's not right. If you give people enough information, what it does, it is empowers their mind to war even greater against the faith that they need to move in the kingdom. And honestly, if we're going to move in the kingdom, you're going to have to be willing to move past your current understanding to actually move in this little thing that's necessary in the Christian life called faith. And so you find this, Jesus gives these guys power and authority beyond what they can handle to train them to handle it. And you think, well, that's not neat. That's not, that's not our version of decently in an order. And our version of decently in an order is really ineffective. It doesn't work. So years ago, I was on a missions trip, and there was a, a medical doctor with me, and he began to watch how I was ministering, and I'd minister, and I'd grab somebody, and I'd say, hey, come here and help me, and they're, you know, they're, they're just, they're shocked. They're like, I can't do that. Yeah, come here. Sure you can. Go ahead. Come on. And then, you know, I, I, I'm praying for the person. I say, no, what do you got? Well, I don't have anything. Yeah, you do. Come on. What, what, what was the Lord saying to you? Oh, well, he wouldn't say anything. Sure he was. Come on. Well, I started thinking about this. Yeah, okay, now just tell this person. Don't tell me. And then this person begins weeping at what this person's prophesying to, prophesying to them, and they didn't even know it was prophetic. And so he's watching me do that. And then I would say, okay, now there's so many people here. You go over there and you get a line of people praying with, with, that you pray for. And they're like, no, I can't do this without you. And I'm like, man, you were, you were getting this from God. You don't need me. You did it with me one time. Now go do it on your own. That's right. That's and then, come on, you get somebody else and you do the same thing with them. And the doctor looked at me and he said, oh, see one, do one, teach one. And I said, what? He said, yeah, man, that's the medical school motto. I said, what? He said, yeah, that's the medical school motto. When I was in medical school, and that's what he was, a physician, he said they allowed us to see a procedure one time. The next time we were doing the procedure, after that we were teaching it. That's why they call it practicing medicine. Come on now, I mean, you just <laughs> made me a little bit. No, we're not talking about brain surgery here. We're not talking about neurosurgery. But when, when they had to open someone up with a scalpel or when they had to put sutures in someone, here's what they discovered. They discovered if you sit around and if you watch for too long, it begins to build up this aura of this, this thing that is just grand. And you become paralyzed by the analysis and the overemphasis of watching, and this thing becomes so large in your mind that it actually hinders you from being able to enter in. And so that's my motto in ministry Somebody gets to see ministry one time, you're doing it the next time, the third time, you're teaching somebody else how to do it. I saw some of you just clutch up, just severely. In that. We have to get people past the fear of whether or not they're going to do this thing right. You're never going to do ministry right. Somebody said, I thought you were here to encourage us, you know. <laughs> you just do it. You just do it and the Lord shows up. We, we had a girl come to our school of ministry. First of all, she got born again. She ended up coming to our school of ministry. Her entire family met the Lord. She's got this vision. She's already done mission stuff and she's got a vision to, to live on the mission field. She's radical. Here's how she had an encounter with the Lord, met the Lord, and ended up coming to our ministry school. One of our students, actually was a former student, a graduate, uh, was uh, in her restaurant. She was a waitress, and he began to attempt to minister to her prophetically, and everything he said to her was wrong. 
It wasn't even close. She said it was crazy wrong. I mean, it was like everything was exactly backwards. And she was so stunned. She said, what are, what are you doing? <laughs> what, what is this? And he said, well, at my church, they teach us we can hear from God, and we're supposed to be going out and helping people. You know, I'm usually pretty good at it. <laughs> it's not really working right now. She got so stunned that people would try to help other people like this, and that there was a church that believed there was a supernatural God and a supernatural reality. She ended up getting born again, coming to our school of ministry. Her entire family got born again because this guy failed in prophecy but succeeded in the deeper issue. Does that make sense? And so we, we've, we've, got to, we've got to capture that culture. We've got to capture a culture where it's okay to try and fail. We have to applaud failure. It's like this. Before you can prophesy, pray for the, or heal the sick, or anything else well, you almost have to do it poorly. Okay? See, everybody wants to have mature prophetic people in their congregation. The only way you're going to get them is if you're willing to embrace the immature prophetic people, give them an opportunity and cultivate them and help them grow as they go. I remember the first time my oldest son, who's 16 now, wanted to help me wash the car. I mean, I could wash my car in 20 minutes. When he helped me, it took me an hour and 15 minutes. Because he's like dropping the sponge in the dirt, he's grinding the paint, you know, I mean, he's just doing everything wrong, and I'm loving it because my kid is wanting to help his dad. And honestly, I'm going to be just dead honest with you here. The best it's ever going to be is that we're, we're, it's like taking twice as long to really get this stuff done. When we're, I mean, the Lord could come and just do all this and take care of it, but... He just wants his kids involved with him. He just wants his kids involved with him. This is what it's all about. 